So, welcome to another edition of Featured Business, brought to you by Visibility Impact and your host, myself, James Moffat. We have our 75th guest. Wow. 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 <laughs> wow. Right. And our 75th guest here, and her name is, I'm going to try and pronounce it right, Manisha. Uh, Correct. Sharma. Sharma? Yep. Okay. Sharma. Manisha, Sharma. Yeah. Okay, so you welcome. You are our seventy fifth guest. So we've been doing this for. I mean, we try to do it every week, every Friday, uh, but sometimes we miss some for either holidays or or Christmas or whatever. So we've been doing it now here in this kind of format for the last couple of years or so. So seventy fifth, but not our last guest. I mean, we we've got plenty of guests lined up, and they're all very diverse. We try not to have too many people the same because we want the curiosity of different types of guests. And you are one of those different types of guests. Well, everyone has Thank been you. so far. But I mean, what you have in your hands, maybe you can explain what it is. And then we'll, you're going to kick this week. So as I said, Emily can't make it this week. So Emily normally starts the introduction with a song, normally live, or she gives a recording. Now she did give me a recording, but since you play a musical instrument, then you might as well be the intro guest as well and the featured guest. <laughs> so, Manisha. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. So over to you and tell us about what, what is that that you're holding in your hands and then what are you going to sure. play us today? Sure, sure. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. So what I'm holding today is a very beautiful Indian classical music instrument known as sitar. Um, I think uh, it's been famous since the 12th century in India, if I'm not wrong, if I got my theory right. And uh, it used to be, uh, surprisingly, used to be a very masculine instrument uh, because it requires a lot of strength when you strum it. Uh, so uh, only off late women started playing this instrument because women are everywhere and we are all chasing equality. Uh, and why I really picked this instrument is I don't know, because I think I, I feel that there is some connect with sitar. Uh, when I heard it in some uh, Bollywood movies, old Bollywood movies or songs, I thought this is what I wanted to learn. And this was like in, uh, I think five years ago is when I wanted to learn it, but I did not have enough uh, people around me who could train me. Uh, I did not know where to go because sitar itself is getting distinct in India. Uh, although it's a beautiful instrument, I'm sure you will agree once I play it for you. I'm not sure if you've ever heard sitar in your life. But um, yeah, so let me play it and then maybe I'll explain better. Uh, maybe I can take your feedback of how you think about it and what you think about it. So what I'm going to play is a rendition of rag. So we have different ragas. So in Indian classical music, uh, we have uh, ragas divided, like sim you, you, you call them symphonies or renditions of different musical notes. So the, the notations in Indian classical music are divided between uh, different uh, clusters of notes that you call ragas. Okay, and uh, these notes or the renditions or ragas, they, they elicit different mood. They are meant for different mood. They are meant to evoke different emotions, mood, feelings. So for instance, the rag that I'm going to play today is rag todi. Uh, difficult to pronounce for all of you maybe, but it is supposed to evoke feelings of, um, uh, what do we call, feelings of melancholy. Uh, very, very deep, in-depth raga. It will definitely make you emotional. But I'm not, so uh, I'm still on to it. I'm still learning because the sitar is tuned on that raga. So I'm stick to following that, uh, that rag. Uh, let's start with it. I'm going to just set a pace and then start with my rendition. <laughs> Thank you. 
Beautiful. Thank My you. Guitar. Thank you so oh, much. This is not guitar. Is it uh, guitar? This is, it's sitar. We call it sitar. Okay. Um, so, you know, uh, so, uh, interestingly, uh, people thought it's very similar to guitar. And even some Indian musicians, they sort of made or innovated uh, an instrument that's mix of both. There is another instrument which is known as zitar, which is a mix of uh, sitar and guitar. Oh. So very, very famous Indian classical sitarist Niladri Kumar, he's made it. So, it, I mean, it sounds fantastic. I mean, just when you started strumming kind of the, the strings already, uh, you can feel the, the, the magic of it. So, but I mean, it, it looks heavy. Is it heavy? It is heavy, but uh, you know how, what is it made of? So if I'll just show you, this yeah. is how it looks like. Wow. It looks very heavy, but this part, okay. The, this yeah. part is made of um, pumpkin. Pumpkin. This is made of pumpkin. Yeah. Calabash. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And for Americans, yeah. because for Halloween, they can kidnap it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I look at all the, the strings, uh, how many strings does it have? So it has, uh, the main strings are six or seven, depends on the kind of sitar you have. There are varieties. There is Pandas Ravi Shankar style sitar. There is Vilayat Khani sitar. So these are famous sitarists who sort of made their own, customized their own variety, variations of sitar. So originally five or six strings and the sympathetic strings. So the one that I played initially sounded like. Yeah. These are uh, 11 to 13, between 11 to 13. Wow. wow. Uh, is, it yeah. hard, is it hard to tune it? Uh, it, it is. It's, it requires a, so, so sympathetic strings take around 20 to 30 minutes to tune. But you can, uh, you can tune, tune it as well. I can tune it, of course. Of oh. course. <laughs> it is hard to tune. It requires a lot of zeal energy. Sometimes the strings break and they hurt you. So my, so if, I don't know if, if I can show you the my the the permanent mark yeah, on my oh, yeah. finger. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. So but this they, is this is the permanent mark on my finger when I. I play. used to play guitar. This is why I asked, but uh, now I cannot. I had an incident, so I cut my finger. So now I cannot really. <laughs> now I don't uh, really play with uh, guitar, but really enjoy music. To, uh, I, I guess these are steel strings. These are one, this a copper string as well, uh, oh. a steel, like a stainless steel string as well. Uh, yeah, so it depends on, so some strings are very thin because, so the last two strings are thin because they're supposed to vibrate more. So these strings are very thin, but the main string that I'm playing is a little thick. This is very thick. Then we have a copper string, which, which is... Oh, yeah. So yeah, there's different uh, combinations of strings to get so, the kind of feel you want to create. Is it hard to learn? It is. It is supposed to be one of the most difficult instruments in Indian classical music. Uh, but uh, what is hard if you set your heart to it? So, yeah. so, <laughs> yeah, so, do, so. You, do you play in any band? I don't. I'm still a learner. Like I'm still, still learning. Learner. I'm. Oh. Yeah. So I just completed two years. It's, it's been just a two years marriage with this instrument and uh, it takes a lot of time. So all big famous sitarists in India, they, they sort of been learning since their childhood. These are all dedicated families and we call them gharanas in India. Okay. And they've been sort of carrying forward the legacy of this instrument. This is how even Indian classical music runs in the culture of India. Okay. So you have a family of musicians and then the father gives the legacy to the, passes on the legacy to the son, the son then to it, his or her son. So, so who, passed on to, who passed it on to you? Nobody, like nobody <laughs> in my family is a musician. No? I just connected so well with us. So, but I always had this uh, proclivity towards music uh, since I was a kid. Uh, I I used to be in my so I I done my schooling from a convent school okay. and I used to be in my right. okay H hang on a second right so for the people that have just joined so welcome and yeah we because Emily can't make it today and because um, Anisha actually plays an instrument so she is our guest instrument uh, artist for uh, the intro 
So now nobody knows about you. So let you, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. So just tell us a, a, a bit about who you are or where, where are you at the moment and where are you from originally? Yeah, sure, sure. Hello. All right, please excuse me. That's another one online. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. uh, In the sure. new crazy situation, it's normal. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, uh, so, I mean, we, we start off, as I said at the beginning, we start off uh, going back to kind of the beginning and work your way through your childhood and some memorable experiences and stuff, which I, I've just read some of them here and, and they're great. So I'm going to talk about those as well, or you're going to talk about them. So I just want to know now uh, where you were born and where you're living now. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a, I'm a Delhiite. That's how we call it. People who are born and brought up in Delhi, a part of India, uh, yeah. capital of India, rather. And um, uh, right now I am in Delhi NCR, like an extended part of Delhi, which is Gurgaon. I don't know if you, I'm sure you know about Gurugram. Or Gurugram. Oh, very well. Been just, there a few times. Yeah, yeah. So I am in Gurgaon. Um, <laughs> yeah, all well, it's basically a Gurgaon is now a hub for all the corporates. Uh, all I, the best of no, the only place I've been to actually is Hyderabad. Oh, Hyderabad is one of the most exciting cities in India. Really? Huh. Exciting in the sense it's quite developed. Uh, people all would the want to go companies. there. A lot Sorry? of IT companies uh, headquarters. Oh, yeah. Uh, IT lots, companies, lots of, definitely. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Okay, anyway, back to you. So, and you're yeah. living... Why, why, I, did you, uh, why did you change yeah. kind of the place? I mean, was that for work or for family reasons or what? Yeah, so um, I so I was with my parents in Delhi uh, up till 20, I was 26. And then I got married. And uh, so, so you're 27 so, now. Uh, <laughs> no, no. How old do you think I am? James? 27. I want to know that. 21. I'm not 27. Oh, that's so sweet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not the case. I'm 34 year old. 24. 34. 34. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I've been, it's been seven years like I'm married now. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And, so, and your, your husband is Indian? He is Indian and... Um, well, you seem um, disappointed there, eh? <laughs> he is Indian. <laughs> <laughs> no, and in India, there is this trend. Once you get married, you have to leave your parents' house. You have to go settle down with your husband and his family. So that's the kind of culture we are into. However, um, so my husband decided that he will buy a, or rent out an apartment where he will get his parents and I can get mine. If, so he's given me an open offer because I, I have just one elder sibling. My elder sister is in Bangalore and uh, my parents uh, are aging. So we decided that, okay, we will maybe rent in a, com uh, a society or an apartment near my parents' house. That's what we did. And after five years living in Delhi, we realized that, you know, like uh, I was getting offers uh, to work at Gurgaon, which is quite distant from the part of Delhi I was staying in. So we all decided that we will move to Gurgaon and buy our own apartment. And we moved to Gurgaon. I also bought uh, an apartment for my parents. So they're also very living very near uh, my in the same vicinity rather. So, yeah, uh, that's how Gurgaon okay. happened. So I have. Uh... I'm just going to digress a little bit. Just a, a question. Yeah. So, when you get married, I mean, was it an arranged marriage, or is it was it more natural? Because I knew previously, maybe in your parents' time, it was more arranged, and then there was always this dowry or whatever you call it, where the husband's family or, or the bride's family—I can't remember which way around had to pay money and something. Does that still exist? Yeah. Unfortunately, it still exists in some parts of India. Uh, it's very saddening. It's very, and it's now like it's part of the DNA. It's it's only it's never ex expressed, but it's supposed to be you know taken a note of when you're getting married, especially when it's an arranged marriage setup. 
uh, girls families suppose because they're sending off their girl they have to pay a lot of dowry and dowry not like cash or liquid money or or just jewelry and all but they have to like give cars they give cars uh, expensive cars they give expensive uh, uh, you know they they end up giving the whole furniture to the guys house to s- sort of ensure that okay we are paying them because you my my daughter will be now dependent on you which is very sad despite the fact that daughters are now all working like they're not dependent on their in-laws in india any more and it still must, the, the trend is still there it must have been tough then previously then when parents uh, had a daughter and then so then the next one came out another daughter and another daughter and then, oh it's going to cost us a fortune it does cast a fortune and in some in people there are communities in india okay we are like very diverse uh, there are so many communities so uh, sharma is a different community of brahmins so my father and like you know they've been brahmins and then there are communities who call themselves baniya there are communities who call themselves punjabi so there are different diverse communities of people and they have their own set of cultures uh, dowry exists everywhere Unfortunately. Yeah. So we, I, I know we could probably talk about this subject also uh, all day long, but we're going to move on from that. Uh, but very interesting to understand cultures as well and and different generations, how they fit into that culture. So but anyway, uh, so just going back to your childhood. So growing up as a kid, bearing in mind you didn't have a musical family, uh, is your sister musical at all? Not at all. Not at all. Nobody in the family. Right. I'm but telling you. Just looking at some of the ho- hobbies and activities you did, it, it wasn't. I mean, just one instrument. I mean, you maybe you can tell us the types of instruments that you played and some of the hobbies that you had. Sure, sure. Uh, so uh, I don't know. I always so I've always been somebody who would just pay little heed to education and studies, but run everywhere else. Like all extracurricular activities is something that always excited me as a as a student and uh, i remember uh, when i was 5 year old uh, we used to have a school band and my music teacher uh, he was searching for people who can play flute and that's where i signed up and i thought i thought maybe flute is something that i'm interested in i played flute for 2 years in my school band i also then started learning uh, keyboard I started learning drums so i'll tried my hands at different instruments while growing up but uh, sports is also something that equally excited me so uh, interestingly i for a brief moment joined my basketball team for a brief moment joined the hockey team briefly joined uh, the badminton team and kept swindling between different sports also uh, tried my hands at dancing so being part of all the dance act cultural activities that used to happen so, drama so yeah just on the dancing i mean uh, we had a previous guest also from from india and she happened to be a singer in bollywood so wow yeah we should can i'll connect you to all of these people right some of them are fan- fantastic right but she she lost her voice so then she couldn't sing anymore but i mean she would sing to a lot of the, the the key parts in the in the movies and then she lost her voice and then her career kind of stopped but then she regained her voice but then decided it wasn't for her anymore but i mean interesting story so when when you say about i mean different instruments and things and dancing i mean is dancing kind of a natural thing because of bollywood or is it just in your culture that Indians are dancers. <laughs> no, not all Indians are dancers. Uh, I can surely say that because my husband is a very bad dancer. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, also, I think dance is something that I got from my sister. She's a superb dancer. She even trains people. Uh, so, while she used to dance, I used to observe her as a kid, and I picked it up. But I'm not as good as she is. But yeah, because in school you get exposures to all sorts of activities and dancing, music. So I thought, why not? So I tried uh, my luck there, but couldn't do much there, honestly. So okay, yeah. so but I mean, it's typical kind of Bollywood style dancing, or or. Ah, uh, everything. Yeah. So everything. So in Bollywood, also we have 
a tinge of Indian classical dance. I'm not sure if you've seen some of the movies, Bollywood movies. Ah, lots of movies. Combination. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I lived in the Netherlands and I went out with a girl from Suriname, one of the Dutch okay. uh, and Tilly countries. And yeah, she was from Indian origin and they loved Bollywood. So I, I didn't even know what Bollywood was until I started watching the movies with her. Then I, you get to know the characters and kind of the, the star singers and dancers. And then I, and when people said about Bollywood, oh yeah, I know that movie and that one. And I could never dance her. I was terrible at dancing. I would go to, with her, all of her friends to I mean, parties and things and they're all dancing Bollywood style. And then they're trying to drag me onto the floor to dance. And you know, I can imagine maybe how your husband might feel. <laughs> he hates dancing. Yeah, well, I like it. I just my body doesn't like it, right? so it doesn't work. Yeah. But, so anyway, I mean, so you've you've tried also. I see here weight training, kickboxing. Oh yeah. All right. So yeah, <laughs> that's true. So uh, uh, it's or uh, not very uh, not in the initial years of my childhood, but when I started working um, uh, as a professional initially you have a lot of workload okay you need to prove yourself so you're mostly sitting on the chair and that's when I realized that I am just vegetating I'm not really doing anything about my health and I started uh, uh, I started going to the gym I started going to the club not exactly the gym but I got exposed to different sorts of workouts so that's when I was I was uh, sort of doing the weight training I started doing professional weight training. I had a trainer who used to train me. Um, so did that for two years. And I, then I also was sort of introduced to the world of yoga. And I started doing yoga. And I realized that yoga is something that goes deep down in my soul. And I just went crazy about yoga. I, and right now, it's been eight years that I've been practicing yoga. There's a form of yoga, Hatha yoga in India. And uh, I see that I'm meant for yoga. And uh, interestingly, uh, I feel that both yoga and music, especially Indian classical music, they both have the same purpose. They sort of take you near to the universal energies. Uh, you get more realized in life. The, the kind of experience or catharsis you, you experience when you're meditating, you get the same form of experience, uh, the feeling when you both do yoga and, and do Indian classical music. That's what I feel. And that's where I get my energy and vibes from. So are you a yoga teacher as well? I am not a yoga teacher, but I have gained a, a decent amount of proficiency in yoga because I've been doing it for eight years. Yeah, I think Boyan, Boyan, were you going to say you're a yoga teacher? Yes. Yes. No, I have a problem <laughs> with my shoulder, so I, I can do only maximum this, not like this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Boyan, Boyan joined the gym. I mean, a lot of people join the gym, but don't go. They just like say, oh, I've got a membership to a gym, but I mean, and then you, you clearly see they don't go. I still hear it. <laughs> That's his motivation. I just want to introduce you to Paul. Paul has just come on. So, Paul, it looks like you've got a beard. Uh, no. Oh, it's a shadow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the, the, the shadow where the sun. Oh, yeah, that's a shadow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's about. I thought you'd grown a beard there. <laughs> if you turn it to white, it will be like Santa. Uh, <laughs> so, so Paul, Paul, quickly yeah, introduce. I, I just want you to introduce yourself because you are in India at the moment. Right. Uh, I'm in Kerala currently in uh, India, and I'm a software developer. I make some softwares for publishing industry. I had been abroad before in London and Dubai before, and uh, I was. We are originally from Bombay, and uh, we have shifted now to Kerala for permanently. And uh, from here, I make my softwares for magazine companies and I'm targeting only magazine companies right now in Europe. I got a client in India now, but now I'm targeting foreign clients. That's how it is. That's what I do. So I'm a software expert in publishing industry. That's what I do. Yeah. Uh, excellent. So, uh, I mean, we, we've had lots of Indian guests. So, I mean, I should connect you all together. Uh, like, I, I don't want to be rude, so I'll just let Boyan and Richard also introduce themselves quickly. Well, I'm Boyan from Bulgaria. 
I mean, since I know about feature business, I missed just two or three sessions, which I'm sorry to miss, but it happened. Uh, I'm, uh, I have a consulting company and help uh, small, middle, and also very large companies to do their business better. So this is what I do in different, with software, with websites, with, uh, and I work with a pool of about 10 consultants, not only from my company, but some freelancers, some other companies. So this is what I do. So Boyan has been our longest serving uh, member of the audience. Right? I think he's been on more than 50. Yes, yeah. I think so. Right, so he gets a prize yeah. for that. So he's probably yeah. seen pretty much all the guests. And yeah, then we've got some newbies as well. So I'm just going to pass over to one of the newbies. So Richard. Hi there. Yes, um, I'm standing in for Zara today. So I'm, I'm Zara's um, husband, as probably a few of you know. Um, I think this is my second appearance, maybe second or third. I can't remember. I've been on one before. I do remember sort of supporting Zara when you interviewed her. Um, so yeah, I'm in England. Um, I'm a qualified accountant. I work for an engineering consultancy. Uh, we've just won um, medium to large consultancy business of the year. So wow. our services are quite highly sought after. We sort of work all over the, the world. Um, and I do the accounts for the, the whole group, basically. Um, and I've been there almost 20 years. So, wow. um, so I'll be getting my gold watch soon. <laughs> yeah. If they still do them when, when I hit my 20 years. Um, so that's basically me. We're, we're in the middle of a storm here in England at the moment, um, in the south. So almost hurricane uh, type winds hitting us. Um, and that's it really. I'd just like to say thank you to Boyan for sending this book to Zara. Oh, wow. She'll, uh, she'll be in touch. Yeah, here's a guest. I mean, we, we, we'll probably all get the, the book out. We've all got the book, have we? <laughs> I mean, he, he was, he's a good there friend you know. of mine. In Australia, I hold it up, everyone. Right. Yeah, and and he was a guest the other week, so he's in yeah. Sydney, Australia. And he's oh, a okay. Yeah. Great, great guy, and he was a guest, yeah. mm. and he's actually going to be. We're creating a featured business book, okay. and and th th there's a number of people that are going to be in that. So, if you haven't already agreed to be in the book, or you had to have been a guest, then then let me know. But we have only thirteen slots, and 10 are taken already. So Paul, yeah, Sheila, I'm looking at you lot. Anyway, we digress. So let's get back to Manisha. So Manisha, yeah. right, uh, there's another interesting thing I, I saw about you. When you, want, when you were looking at when you grow up, what do you want to be? You said uh, a news anchor. So did you ever yeah. become a news anchor? No, no, I, I always, so, you know, as you're growing up, you have different aspirations, different phase of your time, of your life. So I, uh, it's initially, I, I wanted to become an air hostess, and then I wanted to become a news anchor, and then I wanted to become something else, but uh, uh, not, your plans are always different to where you land. Uh, so news anchor is something that, so I used to watch news and I used to see that, okay, why not? I can, I can do it. It's very easy. And obviously news anchors are very famous in India. They get their, uh, uh, the, the spotlight. And uh, I, I started practicing how they modulate their voices to an extent that I remember when I was, so I did my studies from Delhi University. I did English honors. Uh, and when I was still in my second year, there was this uh, company that came during the college fest and they were sort of uh, giving us the option to become the news anchor. They said, after the final year, you can, we'll give you scholarship. You'll have to give uh, some audition for it. If you, if you clear it, uh, you might as well, you know, get a sponsored sort of a slot. And uh, uh, so I, I did participate uh, it was for both English and Hindi. I participated and I didn't have high hopes because I wasn't a professional anchor. And then uh, the next day I came to the college and I saw the posters everywhere with my name as the second person on the list. They were ready to offer me some scholarship, uh, but didn't really work out because by the end of 
final year, I wanted to pursue my further studies. I wanted to do, I fell in love with English literature as a subject that I want to do masters in English. That's what I did. And the yeah, okay. plans changed. Yeah. So what age were you then? Uh, so right now I'm a corporate communications professional. I when, work with... Yeah, when you wanted to be yeah. the anchor, I mean, when you went for that kind of audition, yeah. I mean, how old were you then? How old was I? I was, what, 19, 20. All right. And yeah. then, so, yeah. so that, that means you could still do it. I mean, I mean, if, if, you, if you have to be attractive to be a news anchor, then you, you definitely tick that box. But I mean, I, I would like to think that I could be an anchor as well. And <laughs> maybe, maybe we could do it together. Why not? Yeah, sure. Let's open a virtual newsroom. Yeah. I mean, it could be news about real things that people are interested in rather than uh, <laughs> rubbish. But, but anyway, so, and then you said about air stewardess. So did, did what happened with that or you didn't pursue it? No, never pursued it. I was a kid when I wanted to become an air hostess because I wanted to fly. That was the uh, idea. I just wanted to fly. So uh, yeah, it was a but, but kid have, that talk, Talking about that, have you traveled a lot? I did actually. Um, in fact, it came the the traveling, uh, the so called uh, knack for traveling came from my parents. So I come from a middle class family, James. Okay, and my parents were both working. My mother spent almost thirty years of her life working for an NGO in India, and my father uh, was working for a private law firm as a litigation expert, and they were both struggling to sort of make ends, meet ends. Uh, with, for two daughters, ensuring that we get best of education. But uh, there was a rule uh, in the family that every year, like twice a year rather, we have to go out. So they used to sort of spend enough money, but they used to save enough money to, to ensure that we make the most of that trip. And we used to plan that trip every year. So there are summer holidays in India between April to July to June. And these two months is when we used to go out. And we've sort of seen the best of India, like as growing up, both me and my sister. So we've been to all the mountains in, in India because my father, my parents were mountain lovers. So we've got the best of peaks here in Himachal and Himalaya. And you have, uh, you know, vacation destinations. I don't know if you've ever heard about Shimla, Masuri, Dalhousie. So these are all local hill stations in India. So yeah, I got that from my parents. And uh, so when I started earning, I ensured that I take them for a global uh, global trip. So uh, so I took the first global trip with me was to Lankawi. So I sponsored their trip. I took them before marriage. Uh, I took them to Lankawi, all three of us went. And I took them to Malaysia and uh, we had a blast stop time. And, and then, yeah, so, and then I took them to Thailand. So, wow. yeah, yeah. And my husband's sort of also got an act for traveling because of me, because I love traveling. Uh, I'm a Sagittarian, okay? I need to hop from one place to other. Like you've already seen the trend and the pattern in me, like not sticking to one thing at a time, always trying different things. Yeah. So that that's, that's so well suited to sort of get travel as something innate to you, something that you really want to do. Okay, so... Did you meet your husband traveling? No, no, no. I was my husband's client, by the way. So I was uh, in the corporate setup. He was he was my agency partner, mm. and uh, he was serving me. and And I remember. So we both were the manageable age by then. He was thirty. I was twenty six, and our parents were sort of looking uh, uh, partners for us. And uh, that's when he proposed me. He said, uh, hey, I, I found you really good and I think we vibe. Uh, uh, I want to marry you. And it was Ooh. like, it's it's just a few weeks that I know you. How can I just wow. say I want to marry you too? Oh but my. since I was also looking forward to getting married, uh, I said, I need to date you in order to marry you. And, and he said, I don't have time. I have a strong peer pressure. My parents and they want me to get married by the end of this year. And I said, okay, then you better marry somebody else. And I told him that I declined his offer. And uh, this happened, his marriage got fixed to a very strong political family in Banaras in India. 
and i sort of start, started dating to a guy from new zealand and uh, and after like sort of getting uh, two different people and we were still in touch we were friends after a few months of knowing him i decided that no the the guy from new zealand is not somebody who i really want to be my uh, partner and i told i told my husband that uh, hey i want to marry you and he was like it's too late i said please make it work <laughs> and then he did and he broke so he wasn't also uh, very happy marrying the girl from banaras so he sort of ah so he quickly moved on to, when you said no he quickly moved on to another one <laughs> <laughs> because we were both mature okay we were not in love with each other not that we were in love we were but just but, looking for but now, partners now you've fallen in love with each other of course of course uh, but you were ideally looking for a scottish guy weren't you Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're right. You got me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm from Scotland, you see. But, uh, but anyway, uh, so yeah, very interesting. So you you travelled a lot. So I mean, when you were growing up as a kid, you didn't travel so much, and and it sounded like I mean, it was quite tough times for your parents financially. But now, obviously, it's the other way around. I mean, you're helping your parents out, which is great. because it'd be nice to have that luxury that you you kind of return the favor back to your parents. Yeah. Right. So so let's kind of fast forward a bit now. So I I know you mentioned English and and you studied English and you had a, a passion for English literature and and stuff. So was there any particular reason for that? Uh so I didn't know honestly when I opted uh to do english literature in my graduation i didn't know what it really holds and when i started any form of literature honestly teaches you a lot james and especially english literature even hindi literature i have been a big fan of hindi literature while growing up hindi was my favorite subject and when i uh, in the first year uh, i read a lot of poems and then in the second year we were sort of introduced to a different kind of world uh, you know these concepts around victorian era elizabethan era uh modernism post modernism and then uh, colonialism feminism marxism so all these you know different diverse uh, subjects they open a different uh, horizon in your mind they they take you to a different level of understanding and the fact that the basic rule in literature is what i feel that sort of my life rule now so english so our professors always always used to say see these authors and these poets poets are all dead okay so what you're really putting in your exam sheets is something that you feel really about their compositions so nothing is right and nothing is wrong it's totally on how you perceive it if mm. you're able to back your answer with logical reasoning we will accept it and we'll give you good marks but you have to have that logical reasoning to it why do you think that poet has blah 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 okay so nothing is right and nothing is wrong in life is what i picked from literature and really sort of become i became became receptive after that so literature did influence me a lot in terms of thinking in terms of uh, the fact that how you should treat your fellow human beings the kind of studies uh, around colonialism around feminism we were exposed to and we saw a different side of humanity so so, so would you yeah. then say i mean looking at kind of the things that you like i mean you said the sunset ocean stars butterflies rain music indian classical music and and stuff so and then kind of your background and what you're telling us now and and the instrument that you play it sounds like you you're quite a deep person would you say that is true that's true that's true thanks to my dad so i've been uh... well i was when i was 14 year old my dad first time took me to a meditation camp okay mm-hmm. and i didn't know what it is i slept throughout i didn't know how to meditate and i was cursing him that you woke me up in the morning to take me some place that i have not even connecting to and and then after and he's been not listening to me he's been taking me to that same place for for almost a year and after a year's time i realized why he was taking me there and i started connecting myself i started learning meditation and i struggled a bit initially meditation is very challenging you don't really get it if you can get it in a couple of months or years then you're a very i mean you've been a saint maybe in your previous life but uh, yeah so after spending 2 3 years uh, doing meditation 
I, I thought that, okay, I, it's a different level of thinking. It's, it's just taking me elsewhere. And the fact that, you know, while meditating, if even for a few minutes, you can just be thoughtless. That's the kind of joy you feel is, is immense. It's bliss, pure bliss. So, yeah, he's been taking me to these places. I've been learning a lot about uh, good things about humanity, realizations, enlightenment, and all spiritual stuff. So, so I, I give the credit to my dad that he's been, he's made me a very mature person while growing up. Now, I love it because, I mean, uh, I've become, particularly over the last two years, more connected with myself and... By doing that, you're going on kind of your own spiritual journey and you're going deeper with inside yourself uh, because all, I believe all the answers are there. You just need to know where to find them. And right. I mean, yeah, with meditation, I mean, some people yeah, use different methods to, to do it. So do you have a special way? Uh, so the one that I learned while growing up is very, very challenging because you're just supposed to, uh, you're supposed to be a passive observer. You're supposed to close your eyes and just keep keep uh, watching what's happening, okay? And uh, that itself is very challenging because you can't just be passive. Even in meditation, we humans are doing so much during the day uh, in to ensure that we have good lifestyle and you know we're just involved in a lot of materialistic stuff out there, earning, uh, making a living, meeting thousands of people. So when you close your eyes, you're bound to get those episodes back to you. You can't just be thoughtless. You can't just be a passive observer. You have you get involved, and uh, so yeah, it took me a while to really be a passive observer. And just you know, the moment you are indulged in a thought or you get involved in a thought, you're supposed to ignore it. You just go back and start from scratch. And that's the practice that you're supposed to do. It's very challenging, honestly. But yeah, as you said, there are other. Now I can do it because I've been practicing for so many years. Uh, or I think 20 years. Yeah, 20 years. So now I can do it quite easily. I, whenever I sit and I want to meditate, I can do it. So but it, 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 it helps. I mean, with the yoga as well, because yoga, there's a certain element of yoga that is part of meditation as well. So did the yoga help with the meditation? Yoga does help. Uh, yes, it does. And yoga, honestly, uh, I'm sure Shayla will agree with me because she's uh, an expert in the subject. It is more to do with mind and then to do with, with, with body. Yoga, yeah. yoga is basically to channelize your energies. Yeah, I think I could channel it through your music that you play. And I think Shayla did as well because I was watching Shayla and it seemed like she was really connected. Yeah, Inra as well. You know, yeah, well. I mean, music always speaks to me. And I think of people like Ravi Shankar, um, you know, who was very made famous because of the Beatles, actually, um, using his music in their music. Um, but I, I love bhajans. I love listening to sitar music. I have some, you know, not a lot, but I do have some. And I always just go on a journey when I'm listening to, to sitar music. So um, Indian classical music. And uh, sacred music, the bhajans, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, um, yeah, are right. something that always touch me very much. So uh, it's lovely to hear um, even the little bit of playing that we got to hear at the beginning. Um, yeah, I was on a journey. <laughs> yeah, excellent. No, I love it. Uh, I think, Inna, you, you need to shoot off now, do you? In uh, yeah, uh, so actually, yeah, I have to, to, to leave now. I, I'm sorry to, to leave you. And uh, yeah, it, it's been a great story as usual. Uh, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Thanks, you know. Um, and um, just a, a quick uh, comment. Uh, I, I'm also someone who loves literature and who uh, was brought up with literature and I can relate to what you are saying and how you feel. So yeah, it's always a pleasure to find such people. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yes, thanks. Bye. See you Bye. next week. Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay. So yeah, I just wanted to touch on that. So now we, we kind of need to quickly switch over to what you're actually doing today. So we've heard a, 
a, a little bit about you, although there's probably tons more that we would like to know. But what do you do now and where are you on that journey? And, and how did you get there? Yeah. Yeah. So honestly, James, uh, I don't know if it's to do with divine energies and interventions. I always wanted to do something else in my life to where I am today. And I feel that maybe I deserved more. So I got better, always better. So I never wanted to marry my husband. Okay. I chose the New Zealander. And I, I don't know, accidentally sort of realized. Don't show him this, this video the then. Don't, he doesn't want to hear that. <laughs> But, but, but now you're deeply in love. Of course, and he knows. Okay, we are ah, okay. more friends than right. husband wife. Right. So okay, he's, okay. he's somebody who's, who's my go, go to person, even now in seven years. After seven years, people laugh at me saying that, really? Because we are like more friends. Uh, yeah, so I always wanted to do something else in life. I wanted to do the kind of profession I'm into right now, corporate communications, never even thought that maybe I'll get there because I wanted to do more of literature. Even after doing my master's in English literature, uh, I, I did content writing for a brief uh, number of months or year, or almost a year. And, and then I realized that, okay, and I switched to marketing. And then I realized that uh, I'm not sure if I thought maybe I'd do a PhD in literature because I was so in love with it. And I started applying for colleges in, in England because that's where you get best of English literature uh, uh, colleges and you know best of professors because that's the origin uh, of English literature. And, and then I wanted to, I almost prepared myself to go study there, do something. And, and then my mother met with a, an accident. Uh, um, it, she's all fine now, but that is when it was critical and she needed me beside her. And my sister was already married by then. So I was the only one to sort of take care of her. So for, I, I then had to literally, uh, I, the kind of colleges I was looking at and I sort of just kept everything aside, took care of my mother and uh, life took me elsewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so I started, uh, she has something to say. Sorry? I thought we she has something to say. To say. No, no, no. She, she, she wants to know what I'm doing. Uh, I'm talking to a bunch of people every week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, she's bored. Daddy. Yeah, one minute. <laughs> How cute. When you, when you said one minute, somebody else yeah. got taken. Yeah, so, sorry, I mean, carry on. This is, this is normal distractions that I get. But yeah, carry on with the story. Yeah, so then um, I, I got an offer from a company, uh, started working there as a corporate communications manager. I didn't know what corporate communications is all about, but I learned there uh, my, the, the first boss that I had, he sort of trained me from scratch and uh, worked there for a couple of years, two years, hopefully, yeah, two years, yeah. And then moved to another company, did more in it. Then I thought maybe I'll, I'll do some, uh, some certification course or a diploma program in corporate communications, but I just found only a few colleges had that, still a very uh, niche, sort of a function in most companies in India. And uh, then I enrolled myself for a certification program, did a six month program in corporate communications from a college. Uh, then yeah, I got the, the, the crux of it. And I knew after spending five years, I knew this is what I wanted in life. And I still enjoy it. So currently um, I work for Pernurica India, uh, which is an Alcubev major. Uh, it's a French company and uh, I'm just leading their corporate communications mandate in India. I see also here you're working on philosophy on conscious living. So tell me about that. I am. Uh, so the idea is that you be, so the conscious, it's, it's very basic. It's self-explanatory. Conscious living is anything or everything that you do in your day-to-day -day life. You just be conscious about your choices, about people around you. So I am a vegetarian uh, by choice uh, because uh, because I don't see I, I it's, it's a different philosophy altogether because I feel that you know it's just a conscious choice I want to I don't want to hurt the sentiments of even animals then anything that I procure or I the way I dispose things 
it's just be conscious so that you're not wasting resources. Um, uh, try and re reusing the resources that are available. I, I that reminds me of some episodes when I see my mother-in-law wasting water every time I go near her and tell her that I won't let you enter the kitchen if you waste water. And uh, of course, these are some philosophies that I really live by. Also, the fact that I'm a very compassionate person, thanks to my upbringing, thanks to the lessons of spirituality I've learned, thanks to literature. So uh, I feel that uh, it's very important to carry the empathy in you. It's all about basics, James. Whatever, wherever you are in your life, okay, you may be a top shot leader, a top shot a celebrity. Uh, but it's so important to be sticking to your roots. I feel it's all in basics. If you can just be a good human being first, everything, rest of the things follow. They just fall in place. So I feel it's important to be to be an emp empathetic human being. It's so important to carry that compassion in your heart. Whoever you meet, you must, you must consider that person before you, the choices of that person. So that's very important. So that's conscious living for me. Right. Excellent. So... I, I did ask in the questionnaire about your marital status. And I mean, I, I don't always want people to, to be honest. I mean, well, not honest, but I mean, have to disclose if they're married or single or whatever, because it's their privacy. But I ask anyway, so you told me that you're married, but I also ask if you have children. Now you said no, but I mean, reading through kind of the notes, it doesn't mean that you're not adverse to having children. So what's your stance on children? It's a very deep stance, James, you know, when I wanted to get married, uh, uh, people don't, people just, I don't know, in India, there's a trend, we're just more, more of a followers than, than asking questions or, you know, asking things that are in place. So uh, my father and my mother, they were, they were, they had peer pressures that why your daughter is 26 and not yet married. And, and they used to ask me, well, why, what are you doing? Why don't you have a boyfriend? <laughs> and why are you not getting married? And, and that's when I realized that I don't want to marry because there's a peer pressure on me and my parents want me to get married. I want to get married for companionship. And I'll marry a person who I think will be my companion for the rest of my life. And exactly when it comes to having children, we have a strong peer pressure, like his family, my family, they all seven years in marriage, you don't have a kid. And, uh, and you know, I started questioning, why do I need a kid? And so I, I, I do a lot of research. Okay, okay. I, I went to the crux of why one should have children. And there's this uh, very uh, famous um, excerpt from one of the Vedas uh, in India. We call it Garb Dan. Okay. Garb is womb, Dan is giving away, sacrifice. So it's, it's very similar to a philosophy of marriage. In marriage, it's very patriarchal. I shouldn't even say this, but in Indian marriages, you're supposed to do Kanya Dan. Kanya is girl, your daughter, and Dan is giving away. So you're giving away your daughter to, to somebody else. That's a very debatable topic, so I won't get there. But what is Garb Dan for, for me is you're sacrificing as parents, you're sacrificing, as mother, you're sacrificing your womb, okay, to let another soul come to the world to repay, repay for its karma. And the father is sacrificing his life ensuring that the, the kid get best, best of values so that the karmas become easier to repay. So the idea is that you as parents have to sacrifice your life. You cannot ask anything in return. In Indian families, if you have a son, you're always eyeing that this son will take care of me in the future. The son is gonna take care of me because we are investing in his education, in his studies. So this, this guy will keep us next to him when we will be aging. That's that's a very bad thing to do, honestly, because it's opposite to what our mythology used to say. You're not supposed to expect anything in return. You're just supposed to sacrifice your lives for that soul so that the soul can really come through you. You are just cat acting as catalyst. And you have to ensure that the, the, the soul gets best of virtues, best of skills, best of values. That's what you can do. So for me, it's a big investment and big commitment. I cannot just have baby because it is a prayer pressure. I, I already have a lot in my plate. I am a sitar learner. I practice yoga. I'm a communications professional. My husband is also getting into movies. So we are like 
very committed right now into different things. And when we are sure that we will be able to really do justice to the baby. Okay, baby I'm not going to plan any longer. Or, although, I mean, I always wanted children, but I never found the right partner at, at the right time when I felt I wanted them. So I never had children until I was kind of older. And like my kids now, uh, I kind, of, it's kind of skipped a generation because my kids uh, are younger than some of my siblings' kids that have had kids, right? So it's kind of missed a whole generation. But I, I just felt that maybe it wasn't the right time then, but it is the right time now. And people say, oh, yeah, but you're older. And I said, but does it really matter? I mean, if you can have kids, you can have kids. And it's a magical time whenever it happens. So, uh, I, mean, I mean, I never planned for twins either. So uh, when we heard we were having twins, and that was kind of, a, kind of another challenge. But I, I see it as a positive challenge, even though it can be hard work at times. So, but I, I would never change anything. I mean, I, I love my three kids. And whether they want to look after me when I'm older, it, it's really up to their, like, as you mentioned, consciousness. If they feel that they want to, and hopefully things work out in a way that's a win-win. But I mean, I, there's not any pressure that they have to do it. It's if they genuinely feel that they want to do it. But anyway, so let's kind of skip that or move on from that. So I'm just reading here that you hope to kind of, I mean, you're an empathetic, conscious person and also you want to influence things through small talk and movies was it movies <laughs> not really so i briefly acted acted in a movie produced by my husband uh, yeah. uh not movies for sure but yeah i short, can call so me... something sorry short films yeah, it's a short film. Yeah, so but it's I, supposed to be a short film, but we it's it's on uh, the OTT platform as well. In India, we have. But you've already there. created these. Not me, my husband. He's he's into direction. He's a storyteller, so he's done it. Ah, but so I acted um, in it. Are oh, you in it? You're you're a featured I'm guest. I'm in it. Yeah, I, yeah. Oh, but you have I'm a link to you have a link to that. that I share? do have a link to it. I will definitely share with all of you here. Okay. But it's in Hindi. I'm not sure. I think Paul understands Hindi. Only Paul will be yeah. able to understand it. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. So, first language is... speaks Hindi, so he will translate maybe. Translate in English. We have English. A subtitles English. as well. So, oh, okay. Yeah, so then everyone can access it. Well, then definitely share that. <laughs> so, I mean, when you say the, the short films, how short is short? It's Five a 45-minute film. Sorry? Sorry, sir. Okay. What? 45 minutes film. It's a 45 minutes film. So it's oh. so we decided to make it into a series. So it has three episodes of 15 minutes each. Okay. So I, I know we've kind of finished on the, the time, but we can stay on it a little bit longer if people want to, particularly for the, the ones that came late. And I would like you to, to leave us with the message, but I mean, maybe if people have got time, then you can play us out as well with a, another another because people, some of them missed you playing the sitar at the beginning. Oh, okay, okay. But if you do, want me to play some other rendition, is I have that a okay? Few is that okay with everyone? Yeah. If you stay a few more minutes and uh, okay, so maybe yeah. I, I know I, I've been rude as well. I haven't asked the audience to to ask you any questions. So, is there any questions to Manisha? Anyone got any questions at the moment? No, everyone's quite happy. Right, okay, but they, they'll stay on and, and listen a bit more. So so where you are on your journey, so what advice would you give to people from your experience and in, in, in your life? Uh, have you got anything you want to leave us with a message or, or something? Sure, sure. See, one thing that's always worked with me, I know you think I'm, I'm young, but I'm not. I'm like 34 years old. So uh, in this, uh, three decades or three and a half decades of my journey. Um, I feel the, the only message that I can give is that trust in energies. Uh, I, I sort of, because I start believing it, everything happens for a reason. Everything that happens in life is for a reason and you realize it later. 
I, I've become so optimistic because of this fact. And there's another beautiful message that uh, is from Bhagavad Gita. I'm sure Sheila and Paul understands uh, because Sheila, I'm sure that she's she's fond of uh, bhajans and she understands Bhagavad Gita and its learning. So it's a very beautiful uh, book uh, that we follow in India uh, for learnings in life. Okay, it's a very practical book. And uh, so there's this very famous quote or excerpt from Bhagavad Gita which says, Karmanye vadikaraste ma faleshu kadachanan, which means that only in karma, only in karma, only in your action is what uh, your, your attention should be. Your, your whole energy should, should be in your karmas and not what the, the result of the karma will be and not what you will get in return uh, against that karma. So the moment you start living that, mm -hmm. that verse, the, st the moment you start acting on it, the moment you are just in your present and do whatever you're doing with full heart, not worrying what's, what's going to happen, what will be, what will I get out of it, you start living life. So that's a very important message. I feel whatever I do, I stop comparing myself to others, honestly, because that's a very healthier choice in life. Uh, I don't compare myself. I don't have, uh, you know, I have aspirations, but my aspirations are all encompassing. They're more to do with my inner growth than to do with my external or outer growth. Uh, if today you ask people what you want to do five years down the lane, they always say, I want to become the CEO of blah, blah, blah. Or I want to do become the MD. I want to become this. In I want to be in the C suit of the company. For me, it's more to do with myself. It's more to do with my. We just we just forgotten the meaning of uh, success. It's, success is not about uh, making money and just climbing corporate ladders. It's more to do with your inner growth. It's more to do with where you are in life and how happy you are. So the only message that that maybe I can give is that. Whatever you do, just give your heart to it. Don't worry too much about what's going to happen next. That's what my philosophy of life is. And it's always given me best of returns. That's beautiful. Sh Sheila, did you want to say something? No, I, I completely agree that, um, you know, I, I look at um, some of the people that, that I've known or, or have around me and I find that the happiest people are the ones who tend to their souls rather than to their wallets. Um, that's just <laughs> my observation, but that seems to be true. Um, the happiest people are the ones who, who are concerned with their growth rather than their, you know, their material wealth. Exactly. So that's true. Right. We if you don't mind, Manisha, if you can play us out. Yeah, yeah, just um, give me a second because I just tuned my star to some other. And my daughter will listen as well. Wow, hi. <laughs> <laughs> just give me a second. So it does require a lot of tuning and expertise in tuning. <laughs> yeah, music. Wow, that's a beautiful one. <laughs> the same I do with the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. You miss, I can see you miss your guitar. I can see you miss your guitar so much. Yes, in fact, uh, only this finger is, uh, but uh, I can still do something. <laughs> Which finger? Which finger? This one. You see? Uh, okay, okay, so okay. It's, it's yeah, the, yeah. The rest, the so both. Okay. If you play it, we'll sing it. I'm just, I'm just trying to think, what should I play for you? Okay. Name that tune. Okay. So this is this is a very famous so this is a very famous rock tiller Kamod, and uh, the tune that I'm going to play is from a Bollywood movie. Uh, it's originally on sarod. Sarod is another instrument in Indian classical music. So I'm just going to try playing it. I, I think I'm playing it only after a longish while. <laughs> Sorry, 
Sorry, I messed it up. One second. We never noticed. I mess it up, huh? A bit. Well, I, we <laughs> hadn't, if we hadn't said anything, we wouldn't have even known. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I cannot be wrong. <laughs> yeah. The boy ends going to sing along with it. Sheila. Excellent. Thank you. Make mistakes or not, it all sounds beautiful. <laughs> yeah. But as Sheila said, we would never notice if you hadn't said. When you make mistakes, you turn from musician to composer, so it's no problem. I said, or that's you know, true. I said, a, a good musician or a good dancer, because I love to dance, it's like makes even a mistake look good. So as long as you keep going, that's the main thing. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, even like that, I think I could play that bit. <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah. Yeah, it's very easy. So you're just supposed to uh, take the little pinky finger yeah. and you're supposed to, yeah, just do this. Yeah, I think I could do that one. <laughs> and even that sounds yeah, so sure. good. The trick is the other hand. The right the, place. So this is so this is the pick uh, in sitar. It is known as mijrab. All right. It's called as mijrab, and we we are supposed to do this. So this is how you. Is that just on one finger? Only so so you can see that my my all four fingers are going in the same direction, but mm -hmm. just that's just to create the thrust and more energy. Otherwise. Uh, this is the only finger that's going to do the picking. Uh -huh. All right, yeah. and now, now some meditation for us and some yoga. Sheila's going to. Do you still do kickboxing? Sheila's going to teach us. You still do kickboxing? I do. So kickboxing is more like more more of an exercise right now. Kickboxing, yeah. by the way, if um, any one of you is trying to sort of lose weight, it works like magic. Yeah. Yeah. My yeah. son is yeah. kickboxer. So Shall we have to be careful around you then. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't have to be. You know that my philosophies in life are very sorted. I, I respect my fellow beings a little too much. <laughs> anyway, we kind of come to the end now. So yeah, I, I've recorded this. So I'll share the recording once I've kind of processed it. And yeah, you, you've been an absolutely fantastic guest. And it, it's great to hear your story. And I think some of the other previous guests that we've had, mm -hmm. you definitely, Abby, mm -hmm. <laughs> you'll definitely resonate with some of them as well. 
I mean, and particularly people on this call, I mean, getting to know each other is the reason why we have these calls every week and get to know a new person and a new guest and kind of their story. And it is really quite magical. And, and here in your story, yeah, it, it's just, every week is another bonus. Every, every time we add a new guest, so it, it's really wonderful. So I, I love what you do. I love your kind of your philosophy in life and kind of the journey that you've been on. And I wish you great success for the future. And, and, and to keep in touch with us, because I, I, did, I do ask all the guests if they want to be in the book. And this is yeah. something that your story now, rather than next week is another person with another story, is a good way to capture these stories and put them in a book. And this is what we're doing now. So we already have 10 people that have agreed and I want 13 so we can put them in the first edition. And then th this story carries on and you can share it with family and friends and everything else. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure, James. I think I did mention my consent. In the yeah, form. you did. Yes, so I'll, I'll send you the yeah, details yeah. and then see if sure. you want to be in this edition or future Definitely. ones. Right, and Definitely. Paul, Paul is yet to Paul Johnny is yet to be a guest, so not yet. So yeah, you can't be in the book until you've been a guest, right? And yeah, likewise, maybe Richard, uh, Zara, if she wants to be, and so on. So anyway, I thank you once again to, for being our seventy fifth guest. So, thank you. Kind of a silver jubilee sort of thing. All right, so thanks for that lovely story and uh, have a, a wonderful weekend. And thank you for my audience as well, for your uh, presence and for continuing to, to join. And Boyan, I don't know if you're adding these up, how many you've actually had. And maybe you need to keep kind of a score list because Boyan is way ahead of everyone else. So. I'm, I'm always behind you because you do it, but <laughs> it's a pleasure. <laughs> yeah. And but although there are some regulars here, so it is great to see them again. And I uh, hope to see everybody next week for our next guest, which is a very interesting guest. But I won't tell you anything until next week. Oh. <laughs> Once again, another. Thank you. Great Thanks weekend. a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jake, as well. Yeah, yeah. Bye. Bye. See you later. Bye. 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 Bye.